Hi there, this is Brett Lindenberg, founder of FoodEmpirePro.com. In part two of our conversation about starting an independent coffee shop with Brian Reynolds of Anthem Coffee and Tea, we dive deep into how to find and analyze a location for your first coffee shop. We cover a variety of options from finding and converting a new location to buying out an existing coffee shop business and starting that way. In fact, the last three out of four coffee shops Brian opened have actually been cafe takeovers just like this. Real quick before we get into the interview, if you're serious about starting a coffee business, sign up for our free community by heading to foodempirepro.com slash coffee. In addition to getting access to our private members area, you'll also receive more video training, startup calculators, and more. That's foodempirepro.com slash coffee. Let's get into today's interview. What do you look for in a good, you're, you're just starting out, you're trying to find locations. Oh, I love this. This where, is a great one. Yeah. Where would one. you start looking? Where, where do you, would you begin with that? What sort of uh, characteristics would you look for? Okay, man. So when we jumped into the franchise, they had a team, like they had a real estate guy, they had uh, some branding experts, they had uh, location experts and all this stuff. And as we were inquiring, trying to figure out. Uh, whether or not we even wanted to be a part of this franchise, they said, why don't you go look at three different locations we have set aside? Two of them are going to be A locations, hmm. and one of them is a C location. And so in real estate, they'll rate locations kind of based off of you know what's nearby or um, you know proximity to uh, residents or population. I mean, they take a lot of factors into place. Mm-hmm. So we went uh, as a family. We drove up and checked out the very first a location <laughs> and it was um inside of a grocery store so a really high okay. traffic very busy uh, grocery store area you know but um we, we kind of left scratching our heads going i mean how many times am i gonna go hey brett let's go grab coffee at the grocery store you right. Know, right like you want to go to so it, that was just bizarre to me so the second location that we went to that was an a, a location um it was in front of a best buy on, on a very busy uh, four-lane highway uh, called Meridian. It's basically hell on earth for anybody who knows our area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody wants to be in the traffic that's there. Um, we looked at that, a uh, couple little tiny restaurants, little things uh, nearby, but just it didn't feel right to us. Uh, it might have had the markings of like the, the population density and the traffic mm-hmm. counts and things like that. But dude, for us, that was rated – they, they rated it an A location and it just didn't feel right. So we went and checked out this C location. This C location happened to be nestled right next to a park, right underneath 36 condos that were being built, hmm. a block away from a train station, three banks within hmm. a two, two blocks, uh, the fire department, the police department, a high school. I'm rattling all these things off because – um, first of all, I don't understand why they rated it a C location other than the truth is the, um, the downtown Puyallup area, that's where our flagship store is. And that's just South of Seattle by about 50, uh, 50 minutes. Um, but that downtown Puyallup area was totally co- this depressed, um, n- not thrift stores, but, uh, antique store kind of vibe, right okay. up and down the the corridor and it just didn't have much life there was already in fact a coffee shop just like a you know 30 yards away and it had been there forever but uh, i think the people wanted more they wanted this living room type setting and i remember standing in the middle of the street as my father-in-law uh, he since passed away but he was uh, a police officer in the puyallup area he drove by and said what the heck are you doing in the street <laughs> i said i said well we're looking at putting a coffee shop on that corner, John, what do you, what do you think, man? He goes, are you serious? Why would you do something like that, man? <laughs> I go, well, we're just trying to take a risk as a family. And, and uh, you know, we asked him, what would you do? He said, yeah, it's not my money. You guys do whatever you want to do. And right. he drove off. So right. that was the, vote of, that was the vote of confidence <laughs> Thanks. for that yeah, location. Right. But there was something honestly, Brett, about that spot as my family and I stood there and we're looking at this thing and we're considering like, 
okay, we can see the vision of this area, the redevelopment that's happening, the proximity to the school, the banks, the businesses, the train station, all that. Mm -hmm. And we decided to move forward with it. So what, what was rated a C location became like an A plus, 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 plus location um, in hindsight. Mm-hmm. Now that we look back on it, everybody, you know, the, the advisors, the people that we had saying, dude, you shouldn't do that. Um, that became the number one store in the entire franchise that grew to 27 mm-hmm. stores or so and and now only has about three laying around. So, yep. uh, you know, and, and it didn't even have a drive through. Mm-hmm. But uh, just two years ago, two or th- actually th- three years ago, it became a million dollar store. So uh, it was pretty incredible to be able to, to do that much wow. revenue through that one spot um, and, and to see all the development, man. We got to become the living room of that community, inspire so many other businesses, uh, relationships. I mean, people were forming bands. People were getting married right there from the people that they're meeting in this coffee shop. I mean, it was powerful. So all that to say kind of there is a gut level kind of reaction when you're looking for a location. And you have to, you know, you have to be wise and consider all of the data that also goes into that spot. But I think ultimately there's a personal question you have to ask yourself, like, am I willing to go all in and love and serve the people of this community? And is this where I want to put roots down? I think Mm -hmm. that's the the biggest question you got to ask yourself. Is this where I want to put the roots down and build my brand? You know what I'm saying? Right. And I can see that being hard to do next to like a Best Buy and like, uh, you know, maybe a small chain restaurant, you know what I mean? Like there's always chain, you know what I mean? Like there's always a Wendy's around a Best Buy, you know, those types of business all kind of congregate together. Well, you know, what's Um, crazy too is that location ended up becoming a Starbucks (laughs) only to, only to fail, only to completely fail four (laughs) months, uh, four years later. (laughs) And so then it became an ice cream shop failed you know, and so on and so forth. So it was like, wow, man, it it just, it's crazy um, to think, okay, pay attention to the the key indicators, like the businesses that are around there, the Mm -hmm. schools that are around there, even churches, Mm -hmm. um, community centers, uh, you know, forms of transportation, train stations, bus, you know, whatever, like consider all of that. Um, But most importantly, ask yourself, do I want to plant myself here and reach this community because I think I think we could have made it work at some of the other spots but mm-hmm. it just they it, they didn't have that feel of going like okay dude let's just we're sinking our teeth in and we're going to give it a, our our all you know so yep. what type of a uh, like what what type of like a size requirement or space requirement are you looking for do you have any like rough guidelines that you follow in terms of like we need it to at least be X amount of square feet. Yeah, really great question. Uh, our smallest location is about 1,300 square feet, okay. and it works beautifully. But there, then you hit this cap you know, of people that you can actually fit in there. Mm-hmm. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> and then our large – so, okay. Our smallest location literally is about 1,300 square feet in the cafe. And then you juxtapose that with a 2,800 square foot location that we have. And Mm -hmm. the only reason we decided to bite off one that that big was because of the incredible uh, deal that we were able to arrange with the government of of that city. Mm -hmm. So the city uh, doesn't happen to be in the real estate business, right? They just want to provide a great amenity for their community. And so we've had great success in partnering with various cities, um, even on a state level where we're connected to the Washington State History Museum in our downtown Tacoma location. Mm -hmm. And that was legitimately our number two spot. And that relationship has been incredible. So um, what I would say is like 1,200 square foot sufficient. 2,800 square foot is insane, but we were able to build a conference room. And that's really what hosted our our Anthem Coffee School this, this time around. We fit 20, you know, there's there was nine students, but you can fit 20 in our conference room, uh, and there's enough lobby space for people to grow into, right? Okay. As All opposed right. to the 1,300 square feet where you start hitting you know, 30 people in there, people are walking in, and they're like, oh, we, there's nowhere to sit, and they got to go down the road to Starbucks or somewhere else, right, which is a bummer. Right. Um, but the ideal 
uh, size for our operation. And again, we've got beer and wine. We're uh, making and baking everything mm-hmm. in house. We're doing flatbread pizzas, and we even have these things called anthem fries, where you know they're skinny fries that we toss in rosemary, garlic, and olive oil, uh, and we bake those in a turbo chef. So that footprint of 1,500 square feet allows a lobby of about 60 people. If you strategically lay it out, we have seating at our bar, seating at our windows, and great seating um, like little two tops and four tops throughout um, the rest of the cafe. And then a a very substantially um, spaced out bar layout Mm -hmm. as well where we can have six to ten of our team members working at any given time. You know, we have insane uh, parade days where we have an influx and we are required to have 10, 11, 12 people uh, in their stations just grinding drinks out for hours on end for some of these events. So, wow. yeah, but but then let's bring it all the way down to like 400 square feet. What can you do with 400 square feet? Laughing Man Coffee, uh, I got to go to New York a few years ago and it, it blew me away. Um, th- these suckers, I mean, all you can literally do is have probably three or four people in the lobby, one or two <laughs> baristas behind the bar. Uh, you can't even call it a lobby. It's just a little like <laughs> – it's a little vestibule. But you walk in, you grab your thing, and you come out, and everybody's hanging out on the street and even in kind of a little parklet setting on uh, where they've built some seating and all that stuff outside. But you can make that work. You can create – and I was shocked because there was a line, and the line was worth waiting for mm-hmm. to to experience like this little tiny cafe and what they're producing, man. And they're producing some pretty uh, – substantial numbers out of that location. So, um, so the story of your first one, what, how, um, after you'd been in that first location for a while, like, did you guys use the same process? Like, obviously later on you weren't with a franchise anymore. You were like doing it independently. How did you guys, um, obviously I'm sure you took some of the lessons that you learned from the franchise guys and applied it uh, to your next ones, but I'm wondering like how you approached it yourself, um, like as an independent entity, I guess. Man, great question. You know, for going from our Puyallup location and then adding our second store in the downtown Tacoma connected to the history museum, um, that was totally a, a happenstance thing, right? Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a Hail Mary from the previous owner. He had actually, he had said, listen, man, I feel like, you know, here, here, long story short, we went there to sell him sandwiches and salads one day. We had a, a sandwich and salad catering company, and I tagged along with my sales guys to see how the, the pitch would go as he was pitching this cafe. The owner stopped my guys mid-pitch and said, hey, come outside. Um, and we're like, I, I was like, man, I thought this was going a lot better than it's going. Man, yeah. like, <laughs> take us outside. I wonder what's going to happen. He, uh, he goes on to say, you know, man – I just feel like, you know, it's time for me to retire. It's time for me to be done with this. And I want to give you my business. I've been watching you at the Puyallup location. Um, you know, here's my offer. And it's basically an insane offer that he could, that we couldn't refuse. And, um, and we saw the potential like crazy in that location. It's across the street from the university of Washington, Tacoma campus. So this sucker was on a major growth trajectory. So that that location picked us. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't somewhere right. we went out there and we're grinding yeah. and doing research and all that. Um, so the truth is, is once we got those two locations um, going, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, when we when we left the franchise and became Anthem, I think I mentioned this before, but we became Anthem in two locations, under resourced, underfunded, understaffed, and like with you know, a really horrible first impression to all those around us because, you know, we just didn't know what we didn't know. We weren't prepared, I think, for that growth. Um, but we sat for six years and just fine-tuned systems and processes and and people and really um, emphasized, like, the brand. Like, let's just land this brand. Let's get it shaped up the way we want it shaped up. And as we did that, then we invited a real estate agent that we trusted into the equation, Hmm. And we began to share our growth plans and our dreams. And this dude, uh, shout out Justin Holmes, if you ever happen to see this or if you ever want a great agent, holler at him. <laughs> uh, this guy really listened to our our dreams and our hopes. And then he was able to come back and present a, a growth plan 
And he said, you know, here's some of the, the locations and things that, that we want to look at. And so we just began to examine those things. Um, Brett, I, I, I don't want to cut the story short, but I, I do want to share like um, the deals that he brought were right in line with our mission and our vision and our hopes and our dreams, right? Um, and even one of the communities, it's called University Place. We went and looked at a brand new location that was being, that you know, we could have got as a, a vanilla shell and built that one out. Um, when we looked at it, it just didn't resonate as mm. much. But then about six months later, he came back. He said, look, uh, a cafe, you know, coffee shop just went out of business here. It was this coffee shop slash like kids indoor play place. Okay. And said, uh, you know, would you want to see that? And so when we saw that, we went back to University Place and we're like, this is the one, man. This is it. We can really see ourselves here. So um, as we've grown four stores in the last 10 months, three of those were, were cafe takeovers, cafes that had either mm. otherwise failed right. or um, one in which uh, the owners reached out directly to us and said, hey, we'd love for you guys again to, to take over this spot. And, and and I think that's key. I mean, you know, if you ever have the opportunity to step into an existing coffee shop, insert your brand that you're passionate about, really uh, get out there and infiltrate the community and connect with people – uh, that would be the way to do it instead mm. of building it from the ground up and all the Makes expenses sense. incurred in plumbing and electrical and mm. cabinetry mm -hmm. and all that stuff. You know, just to throw a number out there, 12 years ago, our very first location, again, I think I shared this, my parents leveraged their house and it cost us about 360 grand, which, you know, we're still making payments on that today. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a debt payoff plan to be debt free by uh, 2021. So that's dope. And then we'll be able to yep. self fund from that point forward. But point is, it costs a lot for cabinetry. I mean, that was 120 grand in and of itself. So crazy. <laughs> Rich mahogany and all this yeah. jazz. The permitting from our city was 12 grand and just for a piece of paper that said you can actually install plumbing now. You know right. what I mean? And then the plumbing and the electrical and the HVAC and all of the build out. So it's, I would say, you know, if, if you were ever gonna consider A, starting up and getting into the coffee business, there's a couple ways you can progress through it. You you could start by just doing kind of like popping up at other small businesses or farmers markets and doing like little single or you know single cup sales, right? Here's four dollars for a cup and I'm brewing it right in front of you and there you go and there you go and you start to kind of get your reps and your brand going. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing you might progress to is a coffee cart potentially, right? Uh, where you would take that to events or maybe you're stationary Monday through Friday at a, at a train station or even another local business that you collaborate with and, and you have that steady presence. And then you might consider the brick and mortar route, right? And and finally get up into that spot. But uh, man, yeah, there it's expensive otherwise. And so right. being able to, uh, for pennies on the dollar, get into some of those locations, that's the only way we were able to actually grow by four stores in 10 months. Um, f from a financial side. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, on the on the other side, operationally and le from a leadership standpoint, like I said, those six years we had been focusing on building an infrastructure that was uh, a mile uh, wide and just a mile deep, something that was uh, firm, a foundation that we could actually build something upon. And uh, as we've gone into every community, we've been very well received by everyone in that community. Um, and that's helped to facilitate our growth, man. Do you look specifically for uh, a drive-through service in any of these locations? I know you said your first one you didn't, but uh, you know I know it's really important for some. Like there's some that just it's, do drive-through I, kiosks, and especially here in kind of a commuter town in Southern California, yeah, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. It's just lines outside of those Starbucks drive-throughs. Um, so I don't, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you emphasize that? Um, or did well, Brett, kind yeah. of dependence on your location? It's, it was never something that we were aiming at. And then all of the locations that we have, all six of them have zero drive throughs Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what though, come mid January, we're getting our first cafe, 1800 square feet with a drive through okay. in an existing, um, beautiful village setting on South Hill. Hmm. Um, so, uh, 
we're going to be able to dabble in that arena and I'll be able to speak to that. So right. maybe we make sure we have a session where we're opening that and I'll be talking to you in real time about some of the, the, the pains of opening a business, you know, mm -hmm. that's only weeks away. Um, <laughs> we're no strangers to drive through though. We, when we were part of the franchise for, for a small, for about a year, we ran a double sided drive through. And so the importance of finding a drive through attached to a cafe or, or whatever, I think it just goes, um, so what kind of an, uh, what kind of experience do you want to create, right? right? You can create an incredible experience through a drive-through. I mean, look look at Dutch Bros. Those guys have knocked it out of the park. Uh, there's lines 12 deep on either side all day long. Like these guys are grossing 12 to 15 thousand dollars a day in sales, and people are having the time of their lives <laughs> opening their wallets and everybody yeah. interacting with them the way that they're they're doing it. So. And I've heard it said, you know, you can expect a drive through to produce 40% more revenue up to up to 50, 60% more revenue just by having that as a feature. It's not ever something that we've shied away from. It's just something that we haven't had the luxury of acquiring with the locations that we've uh, selected. And, you know, so I'm really thankful and excited about location seven. Again, having this incredibly deep drive through to queue. Mm -hmm you know, 12 to 15 cars at a time. And, um, you know, we really want to plan to try to create this almost Chick-fil-A drive through experience where you got right. the tablet out there and you're doing yeah. the thing and swiping the deal. And so, you know, we'll see how that goes, but we're planning on creating something like that at uh, our newest location coming up. Very cool. Uh, we'll definitely have to follow up on that one. Um, I guess just to wrap up this one, any other like pieces of advice for locations or things that like you've seen other people like, like you kind of cringe when you're like, oh, you're going to try to open a shop there. Um, anything wow. like that? <laughs> Man, you know, as I think back about about 10, 10 years ago, so we had been open in our one location and some friends, you know, of mine got inspired, I, I believe, and, and they wanted to fulfill their lifelong dream of owning a coffee shop. And so... Not only did we have us on the corner with the condos above us, mm -hmm. 30 yards away, I had that existing coffee shop that was trying to reinvent itself as like a teriyaki shop and a burger shop. And like okay. nobody right. knew what it, nobody knew what it was. And then just around the block, 50 yards away, uh, my friends wanted to, uh, to create a, a little coffee bar called Coffee Bar. <laughs> so they did. And nine months later, it, it closed. Like it just didn't pencil out. You know, they had a few people that kind of would go in and out and thought it was kind of a cool deal. But it's it's like I, I would just highly recommend that people don't just just examine everything from a 30,000 foot view. Don't fall in love with the location and, and there, have the rose colored glasses on, you know, thinking like, um, you know, I, I've always had this dream of this quaint, tiny little, you know, hole in the wall spot and da, 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 da. You have to think uh, – big picture. And even when it comes to branding and what you would name the business, uh, you know, don't box yourself into a name that would only work in, you know, Alaska or in the wood wooded areas of, of Western Washington, you know, um, <clears throat> you might want to open in LA someday. You might want to open in, in Chicago or Miami or New York, you know? And so just, or, or maybe not, maybe, maybe it should be called, you know, uh, Krista's coffee house, right. And, and you just rock and roll and you do your thing and you got your one little spot, but, but think of all those things as you're deciding on location, think of all those things as you're consider. think of, and I don't like to use this word a lot, but competition, uh, think of not, not competition, but those that are in the same business, like, is there enough to go around or, or will you lose, um, out trying to come into a market that's already saturated, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you have some kind of incredible um, MVP is what they call it, right? The, what is that? Minimum viable right. product. Yeah. Like maybe you're going to do um, a, a taco coffee bar type setting where it's the most incredible tacos ever that go really incredibly well with coffee, but also like you have a bar where you're, you're mixing cocktails and stuff too. Who knows what? Like just you have to differentiate do something to stand out. And um, it, it, we're just, we're way past the days where you could kind of pop up a coffee shop anywhere, right? Uh, there has to be, 
so much intention and thought behind it. There has to – people will will feel whether or not this thing was built by design or built kind of like eh, just to pop a couple little vending machines up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I always say this. A, a company without culture is just a vending machine. You ever walk up to a vending machine? You put your money in and you hit the button and out pops your little <laughs> candy bar or your coffee, right? Like that's right. – but, but a company that has culture – uh, connects with a community on a heart level where these people become, you know, raving fans of your brand and they go out of their way to come here and connect with you because you're delivering more than just coffee. You're delivering this, uh, this idealistic maybe, um, influence that, that causes like, like Nike, for instance, you know, uh, just to use a brand off the top of my mind, a tagline that says, just do it. It's like, when I wear Nikes, I feel like I can just do anything. Right. Or, uh, when I'm using it, my MacBook versus my wife's, uh, windows machine, uh, I'm, I'm uninspired in front of a windows machine. Forgive me all you windows lovers out there, you know, <laughs> Microsoft folks. Uh, but when I'm in front of a Mac book, I, I feel more creative. Right. And that's kind of the culture and the idea that Apple uh, set out to, to put together. Right. Same thing. So with us for Anthem coffee, it's like, we've got the megaphone logo, um, mm-hmm. this idea, we have a tagline that says live loud. Right. So when you drink Anthem coffee, you live loud, you can go on and, and take on the day and, and kick butt. So, um, you know, pay attention to those kind of things. Who, who else is in your demographic uh, that is running a coffee bar? And does it make sense? Is there, an, I do believe there's enough to go around, but there comes a point when there can be oversaturation in a market and, and then everyone cannibalizes one another. And I saw that happen first time. Um, in real time with our frozen yogurt business. I don't know if I had mentioned that to you before, Brett, that mm-hmm. uh, 2011, not only at the top of 2011 did we purchase that sandwich and salad catering company, um, but the middle of the year we opened our own frozen yogurt business okay. inspired by what we're seeing in California. Yeah, and okay. And then, then in October um, and, and really November 1st of 2011 is when we became Anthem Coffee and, mm. and branded that. But in doing that, there were so many yogurt shops popping up on the scene. We felt... On our PL, when every single location that opened, even within a 10 mile radius, like we felt it and we can track exactly when uh, our PLs took a hit. Right. Uh, so, I mean, that happens. So, you have to be aware of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The frozen yogurt thing, there, uh, there's still some that there's still ones that are opening up out here in Southern California. And I just like cringe when I see it because it's like, man, there's yeah. one right there across in that strip mall. There's another yeah. one over there and they're like, they, they can flip wave over. at each other. Yeah. yeah it's, it's just, it's just like, uh, feel so bad. 2011, at least you guys were like way ahead of it. Probably, probably, especially out there. Uh, yeah, we were, were, man. Probably oh, one of the it was, first, but yeah, it was like printing money, man. I got to tell you like yep. the, the first 40 days, but then mm-hmm. after that, like then winter hit and we realized, mm-hmm. Oh, seasonal business, right. you know, this isn't California. It yeah. rains up here and snows yeah, and totally. no one's thinking about Froyo when it's, you know, 30 degrees out. So right. <laughs> That's funny. anyway, man, yeah, we've learned some good lessons over the years. Um, don't have to spend too long on uh, these ones, but uh, I feel like it's like a question that, especially in that like coffee group, always seems to get kicked around. So wanted to just kind of like ask you it, uh, like where would you start out sourcing your products? Uh, you know what I mean? Like sourcing your coffees, sourcing, you know, you got to get coffee cups. You got to get the little 12 ounce guys. You probably got to get a 16 ounce guy. Okay, so I have to get into a, a headspace of uh, imagining like, okay, I'm starting out. I don't even know where I would where, – where, where do I start when it comes to sourcing coffee? Right. Who do I partner with as a roaster? Do I roast my own? Mm-hmm. Where do I begin? Do and, I grow it myself? And, exactly, yeah. Should I <laughs> join a, a coalition and learn you know, through YouTube videos and figure right. this thing out? Um, there's a lot here I think in this question. I love this question. Um because if I was to think back 12 years ago, um, you know, I'll, I'll unfold our story a little bit, and then I'll kind of re- reverse engineer it with um, the other deal. When we bought into the franchise, we were immediately indu- introduced to Delano's Coffee Roasters, right? Mm-hmm. And out of the gate, um, their service, their style, their mission, uh, the way that they uh, rallied around us, I mean, they really became our business building partner. The knowledge that they had of the industry – 
um, the enthusiasm that they had, like the heart, uh, the way that they're traveling to, to visit the farmers. I mean, all of that stuff was so intriguing and um, impressionable. And uh, it was the kind of thing that today we have such a strong relationship. I couldn't imagine mm. um, ever going anywhere else or even personally ever considering roasting our own coffee. It's the kind of thing where, um, you know, we've We've realized these guys are scientists. <laughs> these guys are great at it. They, they're consistent. They're able to do and focus on that thing. And for us, what's most important to what we do is creating that unique experience in a retail setting. And so we've just decided this is where we want to live. This is how we want to do it. Um, and we're going to just continue to grind with Delano's as our business building partner. Mm -hmm. Now, if, I, if, if this was day one and the idea is like, hey – I should open a coffee shop. Here's where I would begin. I would, in my own area, I would just start to go kind of seek inspiration, I guess. I would I would want to go and explore coffee shops in the area and see, see what I like, taste mm -hmm. as much as I can. Um, every time I've ever uh, you know, gone to Portland, I've been very intentional to visit as many coffee shops as possible. And this was especially when we were transitioning from – Forza, the franchise, to becoming uh, Anthem. I was like, what is? What do we want Anthem to taste like? What do we want it to feel like? You know, we got to completely reinvent ourselves after five years of running a business. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I just sought a lot of inspiration um, for externally. I mean, I remember visiting Barista, a cafe in Portland um, that was built after a, a Barista World Champion. Um, I was massively inspired by Stumptown, um, you know, got down to, to California and visited Intelligentsia and was just blown away by that experience and never tasted cortados or macchiatos that were as good as those suckers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, you know, an I think you got to get curious, get fascinated, get uh, go out and seek inspiration uh, and then find out what you like. And, and I kept a notebook. I mean, I'm like taking mm -hmm. notes like crazy on this stuff. So this is where I would begin. And then I would begin to ask questions like, do I want to partner with a Stumptown or an Intelligentsia or, you know, an Olympia Coffee Roasters or um, or how do I know? And I just think it's a matter of besides the product you're going to buy, there has to be a connection relationally. Like, mm. are, they, are they concerned with helping to build your business and your dreams and your goal? And that was the hugest difference as I – you know, with searching and seeing what else was out there and tasting the Intellis and tasting the Stomp Towns. And, you know, I was like, are these guys going to be as concerned about my well-being as an owner and our business, like our brand, as Delano's has been, DCR, uh, over all these years? And, and, and then when I went back to DCR to try to figure out, you know, we had been using one roast for all these years too, one, one specific – um, Italian dark styled roast as part of that franchise, we got to choose, you know, the roast that we wanted to go with the profile and the, uh, the blend. And so as we sat down and did blind tastings and cuppings, I fell in love over and over and over and over and over again with this one coffee that for me, it brought back those feelings of mm. my time in California with Intelligentsia and the times that I would taste uh, Stumptown coffee after eating donuts at the crazy donut place that's in Portland, right? Um, and, and so it evoked those same kind of emotions and it was just, to me, better and more consistent and more accessible. And it was the one that's like, okay, this is Anthem Coffee. That's where right. we landed. And so Delano's has built their business over the years on building other people's businesses, which I love that concept. They've really, they just said, look, we're going to ensure that you're successful. And by doing that, will be successful, right? Mm -hmm. When you give, you get. That's the idea there. And so they've been an incredible business building partner for us and they continue to be to this day. So shout out Delano's Coffee. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, coffee, um, you know, taste, taste, everybody's got a different taste. So you want to find yeah. something that, you know, you can really like, like, yeah, this is awesome. And then also, you know, try to find somebody that matches the same story uh, or the same like mission, you know, mission alignment overall yes. with the coffee shop. I think, yeah, I think that's a great, really awesome way to approach it. Um, Brett, that's huge. And you highlight one thing too, just make sure, I mean, like you said, everyone's taste buds are different. So as an owner, find mm -hmm. something that you're passionate about, you're stoked about, mm -hmm. uh, and, 
because otherwise, if you're not if you're not stoked on it, nobody else is going to be. Right. Be, I think because we were so excited, and because when our team tasted it, it was like, whoa, yeah. this is way different than what we've had. Yep. And there was a risk in that going from this mm-hmm. darker roast to this like light to medium roast that was flavorful, but yet, you know, I mean, we had to play with our extractions and how we were going to prepare it for people uh, to get it just dialed in to the point where this this was not like, oh, where did the strong tasting coffee go or the you know, the smooth taste that we were used to, this was like, whoa, my brain's exploding now. What's happening? Why is this so good? And it created really cool conversations when we made that changeover and mm-hmm. our team was pumped about it. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great process for like the roasting. How about like the cups? Do you go like, is there like a website you go to for like the... Oh, for like um, paper cups. Like paper cup type things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. your supplies for everything. So what's yeah. cool, you know, thankfully for us... Uh, in partnering with Delano's Coffee Roasters, they also d- deliver and distribute cups. And, oh, nice. You okay. know, they've designed a, a, a series of uh, syrups called Barista 22. So for flavorings, um, even white chocolate powders and chocolate powders. What's awesome is when your roaster designs the flavors hmm. to to match and complement their coffee roast. I mean, it's it's a home run. Um, and, and we've played with all the big boys, you know, the, the, the Tarani's and the um, Da Vinci's and the everything that's out there, the Monins and, and they, even as they were creating these flavors, they're doing blind taste tests to try to figure out how, you know, how do we want the raspberry mocha to, to taste just to complement the coffee that's being roasted and extracted and, and put into those raspberry mochas and things like that. So mm-hmm. yeah, everything down to that they've thought of. And, um, again, they continue to just serve us incredibly well. Um, so from there, you know, Costco, also is another resource for yeah. those uh, that would open coffee shops. You can buy paper cups and lids and straws and napkins and all that stuff from them as well. Um, they have all the different flavors and things. But what's cool is Delano's can service nationwide hmm. and beyond. Yeah. And they are a local company to us up here in the Pacific Northwest. And they are a, a beloved brand, man. They, they do a lot of great things. So Here are the three key takeaways from today's show. Number one, make sure your branding, personal goals, and business plan are all figured out before you start looking for a good location. You need to figure this out first because it will determine the kind of location you actually need to invest in. If your goal is to own one tiny coffee shop, operate it yourself, then you don't need to invest in a 2,500 square foot space with tons of customers. If you want to hire a full-time manager, you'll usually need a bigger space and maybe even a drive through to be able to generate enough sales to support them. Know what you want before you get started. Number two, drive through windows can increase sales by 40%, 50%, even 60% in some areas. It's not right for everyone, but consider adding this as an option in your business plan because it can be a major source of revenue for coffee shops. Finally, number three, this is probably the biggest takeaway before you sign a lease at a location, ask yourself, is this the community I want to serve and be involved in long term? Am I excited to be here? If you can't answer yes, keep looking. Real quick, if you want to learn more about starting a coffee shop business, join our coffee startup community for free by going to foodempirepro.com slash coffee. When you register, you'll get access to more interviews with Brian Reynolds, CEO and co-founder of Anthem Coffee and Tea, and access to our private membership community. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Food Empire Pro.